Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that generous introduction. Commander of Sri Lanka Army, District Sportsman, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm and a good afternoon to all of you. I have a daunting task for two reasons. One is to be the last speaker after a very, very long day. And the other issue is to speak on a topic which is very least understood even in the discourse of climate change. Let me also say a word or two about the institutions that I represent. As the chair said that I'm the president of Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies, which is a security think tank that works primarily on the full spectrum of security. So our concentrations and focus and specialization is on traditional security, non-traditional security, and transnational security. We also deal with key strategic issues both in the region and beyond the region. I'm also the current chair for the last three years of the Global Military Advisory Council on Climate Change, which is the preeminent international body based out of The Hague and Brussels that works on the security implications of climate change. Our council members come from all the continents, so we have a global footprint. We work with governments, international organizations, with specialized bodies, and we are present in all international negotiations on climate change. So, with that very brief introduction about the organizations and the institutions, it is my task to speak about a topic which is called climate geoengineering. But before I do that, let me briefly tell you where we stand today in terms of climate change. It is a known fact that the global temperature is rising. There are severe damages and impacts on the global climate and environment due to human-induced activities and conditions. So with that impact and conditions, we stand today with the rising temperature, the caps of ice at the polar areas is melting. With that impact, the sea level is rising. The global weather pattern is changing. The monsoon air and the, and the cycles are changing, impacting on water security and impacting on food security. We have issues of disasters, as you heard from my previous speakers, which are now increasing both in numbers, frequencies, and lethalities, causing large-scale human displacement and damages. We also have issues where human-induced climate conditions have adverse impacts and effects on human health. So we are now seeing new diseases coming back, which we have not experienced for many years and decades. We have a nexus of impacts on food, water, and energy that impacts on national security. Large-scale human displacement also impacts on global stability. We now have a situation when we have the prospect of countries that will completely vanish from the map of the Earth, beginning with the Pacific Island states, the Maldives, Part of my own country, Bangladesh, will go under the water. And these are not going to happen after centuries, but this will happen after decades. So we are at a moment which I would call a moment of civilizational crisis. Human species and humankind has never been threatened by any threat like we stand today, threatened by the impacts of climate change. And unless we act together, this is a scenario that is only going to get worse and adverse, and we could possibly see large parts of the world going underwater, thousands and thousands and millions of people being displaced, our food security being impacted, our water security impacted in a negative and adverse manner, leading the world to both interstate conflict and interstate conflict. So this is a frightening scenario. But under the, that background, we now have another human-induced attempt in cleaning the earth, which will, might have equally adverse effects, and it has uncertainties. 
And that is the topic of my presentation today, and that is called Climate Geoengineering. Climate geoengineering is being considered as an alternative option to address the adverse impacts of climate change. It involves large-scale artificial intervention on the Earth's climate system. Concerns revolve around the associated unknown effects of climate geoengineering that we could trigger. A special kind of governance is required at the global level to develop and monitor this aspect of climate geoengineering, which is now being attempted by some countries, particularly in the West. In my own words, we are trying to play the God's hand in trying to interfere with the art system and the global climate systems. We don't know the consequences. So what is climate geoengineering again? It denotes large-scale direct human intervention on the Earth's natural system to counter the adverse impacts of climate change. Considered as the last option to save the Earth from the worst effects of climate change, it might bring some immediate results, but we don't know about a sustainable results that it can bring in saving the Earth. In some ways, this is a shortcut that we are trying to take because we have not invested enough in the pain of mitigation that should be taken in reducing the adverse impacts of climate change or reducing the greenhouse gases. It may be also the way that we can do a drastic change in the earth system in trying to solve the issues of climate change, but we don't know the results yet. So the climate change geoengineering map can look something like this. As you can see, it is complex. So will the results also be very, very complex? There are basically two methods which are known to climate scientists now of doing climate geoengineering. And they're called solar radiation management or SRM or it is carbon dioxide removal, or in short, CDR. In trying to define solar radiation management, or SRM, it is to develop artificial barriers so that the solar radiation can be reflected back to the space before it reaches the Earth's surface at a control level. So therefore, basically, we are trying to create a shield over the earth which will deflect the sun rays before it reaches the earth so that the earth doesn't heat up in the scale that it is now heating up. And we try to control the global temperature which is today the international community is trying to cap at two degrees Celsius. We were all present in Paris for COP21 when this very complex negotiation was worked out in Paris. But as it looks today, that even if Paris Agreement is implemented to the full, we probably will not be able to cap the temperature at two degrees. It will probably go up to three degrees. And now with the US withdrawal from the Paris Agreement and non-compliance by some other states, if it happens, then the global temperature could not only be going up to three degrees, we could see the global temperature rising up to four degrees plus. I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that is a frightening scenario if it goes up to four degrees. Because large parts of the world, your mega cities, the beautiful cities of London, New York, Shanghai, Mumbai, or many other cities will be completely lost to the sea. So that, again, is a frightening scenario. In this effort is to decrease the reach of the sun rays so that the sun does not heat up the earth in the manner that it is heating up now.
how we do this operation. Would you give me a moment? This is something. Okay. Can we have somebody who's not working? Sorry for the interruption. So the way it is done that the sun rays are stopped before it reaches the earth so that the heating does not happen at the rate it is happening now. The ways it can be done is to float small mirrors in the space or block a small proportion of the sunlight before it reaches the earth. We can also do this by inducing stratospheric aerosols by which we induce small and reflective particles into the upper atmosphere to reflect some sunlight before it reaches the Earth's surface. One of the case studies that was done of this method was the case that happened after the Pinatubo volcanic eruptions, which erupted in the Philippines in 1991 ejected more than 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide spreading particles into the stratosphere. These particles scattered and obstructed the sunlight to reach the Earth's surface over the area that it was, it was spread. And following that, the, for the next two years, the global temperature declined by 0.5% degrees Celsius. So that gave hope to a lot of climate scientists that it, if it could happen there, we could also do that artificially so that we can reduce the sun's temperature. Let us now talk briefly about CDR or carbon dioxide removal. In short, it means the elimination of carbon dioxide from the Earth's environment directly countering the increased greenhouse effect and ocean acidifications. On a natural basis, on a positive basis, this could be done by afforestation, so we could have global scale plantation efforts that could slow but more effective way to counter the adverse impacts of climate change by absorbing the greenhouse gases by the plants we are planting. It certainly has no side effects. But the artificial approaches are the ones that worry people. We could have a carbon air capture, by which I mean we can set up sophisticated machines that can eliminate carbon dioxide directly from our surrounding air and store it elsewhere. But this is extremely expensive and perhaps it can do part of the job, not fully. We could also have very large amounts of charcoal in the soil so that carbon is locked up and cannot enter the carbon cycle. But then again, building this kind of carbon charcoal graveyards in the earth is also a very expensive process. Other process that we can do is to do ocean fertilization by which we add nutrients such as iron, urea, etc. to the top layers of the ocean. It can lead to increased growth of plantations and other species on the surface of the water that can draw down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This can then sink from the surface to the deep ocean and bury it there. But then it has other impacts and implications. These blooms can affect the physical properties of the surface of water by absorbing light 
and heat from the sun. It can also change other species. It has harmful other blooms and the production of nitrous oxide and methane. It can also very severely impact on marine life. It certainly has unknown consequences on the overall ecosystem. One example that comes to us about this method is the experiment that was done by an American businessman named Russ George, who made a private geoengineering experiment. He dumped about 100 tons of iron sulfate into the Pacific Ocean as part of a geoengineering scheme of the west coast of Canada. The iron that Spade had covered about 10,000 square kilometers. The experiment adversely affected the surrounding ecosystem, producing toxic tides, severing ocean acidification. There was, of course, a huge, huge cry from environmentalists, including environmental lawyers. But currently, the experiment that I can mention to you that is going on is called the Harvard Project. This is the world's biggest solar geoengineering program to date. It is happening in the United States, and the effort is to launch high altitude balloons from the location in Arizona, spray about 20 kilometers up to the Earth's stratosphere with the purpose of increasing the reflectability of the stratosphere so the sun rays don't reach the Earth's surface. Having gone through the basic science of geoengineering, it is important for us to understand what are the implications. In analyzing that, the consequences that we can now find out is that geoengineering will have absolutely unknown and uncertain consequences. Its impacts may go beyond our control, leading to fatal consequences on the global climate that can impact on the whole climatic atmosphere of the world. Geoengineering technology can also be weaponized in the guise of addressing climate change. So countries that have the technical and the financial capacity to have this capacity of geoengineering technology can they themselves weaponize the whole process by that threatening other nations. It also may be exploited for military and political ambition over other countries by countries which can possess this capacity. It might trigger a race for military expansion and geoengineering might be exploited by military purposes. Especially the aspect of solar geoengineering is the one for its deployment, it will primarily be the military, in particular the Air Force, that will have to grow the capacity to deploy solar geoengineering technology. So therefore, we could see rapid expansion of the military capacity of many rich states. Large-scale establishment in the duty of implementing geoengineering can then become targets of military operations or military attacks. We are likely to see suspicion and blame game amongst nations, between nations, that can give rise to the prospect of what I call weather wars. Once started, geoengineering mechanisms must be continued for an extended period of time to get the intended results. If the process is stopped abruptly, we may experience what is known as termination shocks that will negate the success of geoengineering efforts that has been achieved so far, and the temperature then will shoot up dramatically at a very fast pace, and that will have very, very drastic negative impacts on the global climate. Right now, a very huge OPEC condition exists regarding the research and experimentation of geoengineering, particularly by the states that are involved in these efforts. There is no accepted oversight body to monitor the issue whatsoever. So nations which are growing the capacity are doing it on their own without any international rules and regulation. It is high time we fix the governance structure to avoid unimaginable circumstances in the future. We need 
wider information debate on each dimension of geoengineering technology at an international level is needed. The rules and regulations of the application of geoengineering are needed to be set up which are internationally accepted by all nations. An international body to oversee and regulate the mechanism has to be set up perhaps under the UN umbrella. There should be also verification regime to accurately monitor the impacts after the deployment of the techniques of geoengineering. So with that, we come to what is known as the Oxford Principles. It lays out five guiding principles by which it should be regulated and governed. And that is geoengineering to be regulated as a public good. Public participation in a geoengineering decision-making process must be there. We must have disclosures of geoengineering research and open publication of its results. We need independent assessment of its impacts and verifications. And there certainly must be governance structure before deployment. So to conclude, the way forward should be there should be a global moratorium to undertake large-scale geoengineering intervention on climate until everything, including his governance structure, is in place. The recent findings regarding geoengineering must be transparent and open access must be given to all. A global research pool has to be formed so that we can pull the knowledge all together. There has to be contingency planning should be made ready beforehand at global level so that if there is a climate accident after deployment of geoengineering technology, we have the contingency for managing that emergency. What I would like to say before I end and thank you is that we are at a crisis moment. The global community perhaps has never met a challenge like we are facing from the impacts of climate change today. Unless we all pull together, this is a global problem that will need global solutions. No single nations can solve it alone. As an international community, we all have to come together. And unless we sell together, we'll all sing together. With that very sober warning, I thank you all for a very patient hearing. Thank you very much.